Alrighty, welcome back. It's not often um, we will have a video on one character, uh, but this is a pretty important character uh, in, in the history of science, uh, let alone the history of psychology. So today it is Darwin, or at least for this video it's Darwin. Uh, yeah, so we're going to focus on Darwin. No, I'm not going to go through all the details. I know that, that you guys get Darwin in virtually every course you're in, or at least every science course. Um, so I know now by a third year course, you, you have a really good sense of, of Darwin and his Im impact. So I'm going to focus more on what his work meant in a psychological context. But I'm also going to start a little bit with this history of psychology stuff. I want to use Darwin to echo some of the themes that we talked about in the, in the very first module. Okay, so. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, these two themes specifically. Um, remember when we're talking about history of psychology and telling the history and that very often you emphasize people like Darwin and you can give the impression that, you know, we wouldn't be where we were, where we are now if it wasn't for Darwin. However, I think Darwin himself is a, is a very interesting example of that notion of zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. Remember that. Um, I, I like this quote from Victor Hugo. There is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. There is this claim and this notion that some ideas are just bound to, to happen within a certain context. And during this time of Darwin, the sort of mid-1800s, you know, early to mid-1800s, in a sense, evolution theory was already out there. Nobody had, had sort of nailed it down the way Darwin has or had talked about it, but especially in, in work like geography, um, where they're talking about rock formations, they had a lot of this notion of interactions of, of the world and, and how they've changed as, as environments change. So we've talked about how certain rock structures grow to reflect their environment uh, or the environment of the time. So you could learn about previous environments by looking at rock structures. And you know a lot of those ideas were kind of out there. And what Darwin kind of did was connect the animal world to some of that and, and to say, you know, the features of animals might also be connected to the environment. You've read now and you probably already knew about, you know, the fact that Wallace um, had, had very similar ideas as Darwin, apparently independently um, generated. And that's what kind of pushed Darwin to get his ideas out there because he was kind of sitting on them um, for too long. You know, that also tells you that it was just the time was just right for that sort of idea to be born and to be embraced and accepted. And so Darwin is ultimately the person we attribute uh, evolution theory to, uh, but it could easily have been somebody else, uh, perhaps. So you kind of see that when you read about Darwin, and it makes that distinction clear. So I like to emphasize that. Also, um, you know, screamingly, Darwin is a great example of the notion of a paradigm shift. Um, so, so here's this is actually uh, an abstract from a paper that focuses on this question of Darwin's effect on, on the paradigm shift. And here they focus on the paradigm shift from creation to evolution. So really, and this is why you know some of Darwin's work was so controversial in the beginning when he when he published it in a very religious Christian kind of uh, context. But you know until Darwin. The notion was that God created everything in the form it, it currently is. Um, and Darwin said, N you know, no, maybe not. Maybe things change their form. Maybe the whole variability of life we see is the result of a process, not the result of a creator. Uh, and so, you know, wow, what a big change, right? What, what a what a sort of mind-blowing thing for people right and so when we talk about paradigm shifts Copernican revolution you know the second Copernican revolution I mean Darwin really kind of messed with everybody's heads by saying there's another way to think about all of this uh, so he argued that humans are part of nature not above it you know everything we talked about before right the, the sort of scalia naturae um, the idea of humans occupying that top rung Darwin says no we're just another life form we 
we behave and we we our evolution follows the same rules as the evolution of every other animal um so you know just like copernicus kind of knocked us one when we said well your planet's not the the, the center of the of the universe you know um darwin kind of said yeah and you know what our species ain't the center of the of the planet either it's just another species just like our planet is just another planet so you know humans really began by thinking we were so special and then we have all of these thinkers kind of saying no maybe not um so big big time paradigm shift now he caused this paradigm shift you know in terms of us thinking about how the variety of life came to exist but he also impacted um, a number of other paradigm shifts uh, along the way one of the things that this is really kind of looking ahead to where we're going um, but i want to foreshadow this for when you get there because i'll bring it back up um, this distinction we're going to see between structuralism and functionalism you will learn that the very first psychologists were what we were call structuralists they're going to be conserved concerned with trying to understand what mind kind of looks like what's it like in there um, so almost like physics they're going to try to describe the the structure of consciousness of conscious existence but at some point um, that gets pushed over and and functionalism starts to take control where we don't really care about what conscious experience looks like or feels like we care about what it's doing um, what is the purpose this is a, a, a very powerful reflection of Darwin uh, as well, because if you even think of him in a biological context, before Darwin, and in fact, this is what Darwin started out doing, the paradigm of biology was to collect specimens and then to try to organize them into categories, into groups. And so we, you know things now like reptiles and amphibians and stuff. So people looked at all these and they said, okay, this is a reptile and this is a mammal. And, and so they would spend a lot of time. And when you know uh, Darwin was originally out on the voyage of the Beagle, that's what he was doing. He was collecting all these rare specimens from South America, a very strange part of the world for the British, and trying to figure out how these new critters fit in this organization scheme. And so if we think about it there, people were looking at what the critters looked like to figure out which category they belong to. But at some point, Darwin said the following, these things look the way they do for a reason. And that reason is when the critters look this way, there's a benefit for them. There's something good about having a beak like that one has. Uh, and it's not just good in general, it's good in context. And what I mean by that is that beak works really well for that animal in the world in which it lives. Um, another version of that animal who lives in a different world may have evolved a different kind of beak that works well for it. In its so so you know just to be a little more concrete, he he focused on finches, and so he would he noticed that some finches had long pointy beaks which was good for them because they ate a lot of insects and trees. So that allowed them to get at the insects. Whereas other finches had short, powerful beaks and that allowed them to crack nuts, which was good because there were a lot of nuts where they lived. And so it seemed like whatever food was plentiful, the, the characteristics of the animal reflected their food source. Um, and, and that was the beginning of his evolution theory. But in, the, in this case, it's like, it looks that way for a reason. Don't get hung up on what it looks like. Get hung up on what it does. You know, what's the function of that? Uh, and so his ideas did sneak into psychology, as you'll see. And let me, by the way, back up 1809 to 1882. You're going to see this is around when psychology is starting. Okay, um, as, as you will see. And so his ideas were percolating through the academic community, the intellectual community, and they eventually pushed people away from structuralism towards functionalism. So the effect that he had in biology to make people start to ask, why does the animal have that uh, you know, kind of feature also had an impact in psychology. And we started asking, why do those thoughts occur the way they do? What are those things doing? I'm going to come back to this point, um, but I just want to, to foreshadow that. Okay. A couple of other things to say about Darwin just in the psychological context. First of all, um, there's a whole class now of psychological theory um, that is sometimes connected to evolution. Uh, and so there may be something like consciousness where we can say, you know, humans seem to be aware of their own thoughts. 
why? What's the purpose of this? What's the use? And I'll give you one example of this. Um, one thing that I've thrown out there about consciousness is that what it allows an animal to do is replay a learning experience in their mind. And so I, I say things like, imagine a, a deer brought its, brought its uh, one of its children to a watering hole and was attacked by a predator that lived somewhere nearby. And it got away, but its child did not. Um, and so if that was all that happened, then we would have one learning experience for that deer, right? It went to the water, um, it chose a given behavior, a certain result came of it, it lost its child, um, and that might make it hesitant to go back to that water, but it was only one experience, right? But what if that deer replayed that experience in its mind over and over and kept sort of recalling losing its child in that way? Um, suddenly that one learning experience can become multiple. It can be multiplied in consciousness uh, and that can produce a stronger learning effect. So I don't know, I just made up that story. I, I didn't just make it up, it's based on some ideas, but it is an evolutionary story how an animal that possessed consciousness might now learn quicker than other animals uh, and therefore be able to survive and reproduce at a higher rate. So sometimes in psychology, we, we use evolution theory to, to actually try to describe why certain you know, abilities came to be. Uh, and you'll see that all through. Be careful with evolution theories. Evolution is pretty powerful, and if you're a clever person, you can tell an evolutionary story about almost everything. Um, so you got to be a little careful. But you will see evolutionary or evolution-based theories all through psychology. All right. Uh, so there's that that general thing. But in specifically, there's two branches of psychology that didn't exist before Darwin. Uh, well, they, nothing really existed before Darwin, but they really came to exist by building on Darwin's ideas. So the first one of these is individual differences. Um, a lot of psychology is concerned about the average human being. How does memory work on average? How does attention work on average? How does perception work on average? But there are now some areas that are interested in why certain individuals are different than others. Um, so things like intelligence, personality, creativity. Why are some people more creative than others? Um, can we can we create? Can we make people more creative? Um, is there a possibility? But these parts of psychology are not interested in the average human. They're interested in the variety of humans and trying to explain that variety, which of course sounds very Darwin, who is interested in the variety of life, right? And so they've taken a lot of cues from Darwinian theory uh, in the individual differences research um, that, that we see in a lot of these areas. Um, also, of course, comparative psychology the attempt to understand ourselves by better comparing us to other species. So Darwin essentially said, we are one, we are part of the same animal kingdom. We are all one. Um, and therefore we are all sort of biological machines. And therefore, you know, we can learn about ourselves maybe by comparing and contrasting us with other animals, other variants of biological machines that came to be called comparative psychology. Sometimes it really produces startling results. I'm going to show you one right now and I'm just going to shut up and play it. Um, but watch this, it's, it's kind of freaky and then I'll come in at the end. All right, so let's do it. Time. All righty, there we go. <laughs> So, you know, I bring that up for a few reasons. First of all, Darwin, it's kind of interesting. Let's get some primates in there and, and get you all thinking about that. But on the comparative psychology side, you know, that, that shows you how by comparing humans to another species, um, we can sometimes have some of our, our assumptions kind of mucked with, right? And including the Aristotel Aristotelian notion of, you know, we are the best at everything. And we quickly realize, oh, even when it comes to like a, a cognitive, a reason, well, is it reason? Would you say working memory is reason? I don't know. But even, you know, in psychological sort of testing context, sometimes some species can be better than we are. And, you know, that just, I, I like it because it's humbling. It kind of puts us in our place um, a little bit. Uh, but it also gets us thinking a little bit more about how working memory works and what it might be there for and why, why a chimp might be better at it than we would be. Um, so at any rate, that's a great example of comparative psychology, which is another area of research that Darwin 
um, you know, that really sprung from Darwin's ideas. Okay, so I believe that's my whole Darwin right now. Yep, uh, and I just want to emphasize, and again, I'll try to do a better job here. This is the end of chapter three. Um, so the next lectures will be on chapter.